back to Sledgehammer Horror, guys. I am Ken Sledge, and let's talk horror. Today, I am joined by someone I have just been having the most wonderful conversation with. I actually forgot to start recording because we were having such a great conversation. I am here with my, my good friend now, who I would like to consider a good friend. Eric, how you doing, my brother? I am doing very, very well, sir. Thank you for having me on. And if you are watching or listening, um, he's not bullshitting. We're having a great conversation about a whole wide variety of things. The horror community is awesome, and it creates fast friends. It really does. Um, Eric Christopher Myers, he is a writer-director, uh, most well-known for Roulette and Butterfly Kisses. And, you know, the horror world is something that's very special to both Eric and I. And we're going to talk a whole lot of horror on this episode. But before we do that, we want to talk about something else that's just as much, if not way more important than the horror world to both Eric and I. Um, he is on the board at the Howard County Autism Society. And autism is something that for me is very important. For Eric, it's very important. For those of you that don't know me personally, for a while I was a parapro for a school. I worked with children with autism. And it's something to me that's very, very special. It's in my family. Uh, Eric is on the board. It is also in his family. Um, I won't get into how personal it is for both of us, but it is very personal for both of us. And before we start talking about that, guys, as always, I got all the links down here in the description. I do have the link for the Howard County Autism Society. If there's a cause, I know right now it's hard with COVID and quarantines, but if there's ever a cause to donate to, this is something that is really helpful because it can put iPads in the hands of kids that have autism that can't have that are non-functioning and non-verbal and it's something that can directly help a child with autism this isn't going into a general fund to help out uh, with a cure for cancer or anything like that that we may not see in our lifetime this is helping out a kid right now that needs the help so um what can you tell us about the howard county autism society my friend i mean you pretty much just summarized it about as well as anybody could probably better than i could i'm on the board of directors as you said uh, my son is on the spectrum. It was, without exaggeration, a life-changing event. And um, I would like to think it was one that was a good life-changing yes. event. This was not Thank a cataclysmic you. sort of thing. And in fact, this is what got us talking here at the top of the show. Um, if there are things that bring people together, you have horror, but you also have um, the desire to do good and to make change uh, in the world around you. And in the case of my son's diagnosis, I was actually, he was diagnosed as I was writing Butterfly Kisses and as I had him in an early intervention program, I was filming the movie. So it's very funny when I go back and I watch the film now because rather than sort of seeing scenes and thinking about what was happening that day and what we had to eat and sort of what, what bar <laughs> we hit after we wrapped, I think of rushing home from set um, to work on words and numbers and sounds with my boy and working on helping um, him with zippers and flicking light switches. And it, it was an amazing transformative time in my life that made me want to give back. And I would encourage anyone that is watching right now, um, particularly in the age of COVID where we have a lot of time on our hands. I mean, how many fucking people watch Tiger King? We have time <laughs> on our hands and time that can be better spent. I simply began volunteering. I saw how much um, dedicated educators and caregivers were changing my son's life. And the only way to truly say thank you is to try to push some of that change into someone else's life. So I began volunteering with the Howard County Autism Society. I began working sensory Santa events, which are, you know, so that families can take their kids to go see Santa Claus without there being lines and lots of noise and, yeah. you know, mall lights, things like that, that we take for granted in our lives. Mm -hmm. I began volunteering with events like that. And pretty soon that led to me mentoring autistic um, students on, uh, with filmmaking. Um, I began simply just doing more and more and more, and I was asked to join the board. So with that preamble out of the way, I would simply say everything this gentleman just said is correct. We are continuing to offer services. Our organization, organizations all over the country, all over the world, there are still families and individuals who need assistance, particularly with job layoffs. Distance learning is affecting more kids than just your neurotypical child. Um, do something good. If that means throwing $5 or that means throwing five minutes of your time, yeah. give it a look. And a thing that a lot of people don't realize, and this goes with any child, <clears throat> but especially children that are on the spectrum, 
just having that one extra positive role model in their life can mean so much. And what a lot of people don't know is I said, I worked in the system and a lot of these children, they learn more from peer to peer work than they do adult to peer work. They want to be with their peers. They want to learn from their peers. And so these shutoffs right now are really affecting our autistic children too, just because of little things like that. Sure. They still get the education from the tablet and their parents and what have you, but that peer to peer work is something that's always not, it's, it's hard to get that even at, from a father to a son. I wasn't going to say it was your son. Cause I wasn't sure how comfortable you were, sure. but you know, they, they do still want that peer to peer. They love that. They love the connection and the peer to peer connection. So any way that you can help out any child, is so appreciated during this hard time. We often forget how easy and how small it can be to be a human being and change the life of somebody else. The littlest things we do can really change the life of somebody else. So horror is amazing, but being a good human being is even better. So there's no better way and there's no better time than right now. So while we are on the subject, before we, I want to kind of segue a little bit into the horror here. Uh, You've been getting bombarded with requests to make a sequel to butterfly kisses what can you tell us about that while we're still on this subject okay you have my word um as one solid dude to another that i am not going to mention this anytime anywhere else before this episode drops um but if you have not seen my most recent film butterfly kisses please it's streaming on crime it also voted um support <laughs> physical media it's dying and going away Send my kid to college, please. But Butterfly Kisses is a, um, it's sort of a deconstruction of found footage as a genre. And it's an incredibly, it's probably the most meta found footage movie you're ever going to see in your life. And that's all I'm gonna say without spoiling it. Nonetheless, it has, um, it toured film festivals all over the country, uh, played abroad all throughout 2018. It's been out for two years. COVID is giving it a whole new audience on Prime and other streaming platforms. Um, it's really connecting with people. And um, as the man said, people have been bombarding me with uh, requests for a sequel. My son and I, uh, we've had to obviously acclimate to all of the changes that we're all having to acclimate to during the age of COVID. And uh, one of those many things is that he has become incredibly interested in television and film production, um, in performance, And when Halloween rolled around, my favorite holiday of the year, and we were not able to go out trick-or-treating because it wasn't safe, Mm -hmm. we decided to, you know, have our own little spooky Halloween style adventure. And long story short, we may or may not be shooting a sequel to Butterfly Kisses right now. So uh, stay tuned and uh, I I hope you dig the updates as they come along. And I will be sure to give any updates I can. Again, guys, if you don't want to just get them from me, all the links are down here in the description. I have a link to where you can watch Butterfly Kisses. I have all of the links for Eric as well. So make sure you're checking all this stuff out. Follow him so you can stay up to date on everything he's doing. But today, my friend, I can't wait till eventually talk to your son about this same thing. But today I'm talking with you and we're talking about the first horror movie that you ever watched. We got you started in the genre. And your first horror movie was? An American Werewolf in London. And it remains in my top three favorite horror films of all time to this day. Ah, oh, dude, what? we need to talk about that release because what's better, that release or the previous release? See, I just have the newer one. Okay. The restored one. Um, it's one of those things where I was so anti-Blu-ray for the longest time. I was, you know, I grew up in a video store. So right. I've always been, I still got my whole VHS collection and it's something that I've always, you know, oh, VHS, it's, it, that's where it's at. It's like, okay, not to interrupt, not to interrupt, but how old are you? 34. Okay. I'm 44. We're still of the VHS era oh, yeah. and finding your movies in mom and pop stores. Kids today yes. going on, and I sound like an old man saying kids today, but um, kids today going on Shutter and on Amazon Prime, that is not the same thing as scouring the shelves for the latest VHS release with lurid painted cover art and uh incredibly tantalizing images on the back of the box like this one right here my favorite one house absolutely absolutely and it's funny you say that because like i said i grew up my parents owned a video store we had a mom and pop video store it was called downtown video awesome. and um that was our youtube man walking through the aisles and looking at the cover art that was our youtube that's how we decided and kids today will never know one the disappointment 
of grabbing that VHS and looking behind and seeing that the tape is not there. But they will also never know the elation, the pure joy of walking to the front and asking the cashier, did somebody put this in the Dropbox by some chance? And then grabbing that VHS out of the Dropbox. And it, you could hear violin swelling when they would pick that VHS up out of the Dropbox. So that's something that I totally agree with you. And something you had mentioned, you said American Werewolf is your top three favorite horror films still to this day. It to me is in my top 10, but when it comes to practical effects, it's easily in the top three. Yes. So this is something that really revolutionized uh, practical effects in film. Do you remember how old you were the first time you had seen it? Um, I was born in 76 and the movie came out in 81. I'm from HBO generation number one, which means I was <laughs> sitting there in front of HBO all day long when they would have, you know, three movies to show and they would just play them over and over and over again. And yep. American Werewolf, I want to say it premiered on HBO. I want to say it was 82. And, um, I remember very distinctly that my father would watch whatever the, the HBO premiere was on Friday night. And it didn't matter to him whether it was sort of age appropriate. He didn't care if I was sitting in the room. Um, right. Ask me about the first time I saw the world according to Garp. Um, <laughs> there, that's a hell of a story right there. But he watched the premiere of American Werewolf in London. And for those of you who are too young to remember, uh, David Naughton, the star of the film, was in a series of Dr. Pepper ads that were constantly on television in the early 80s. And he would be singing and dancing, I'm a pepper, he's a pepper, she's a pepper, wouldn't you like to be a pepper too? And so he was sort of plucked from this ad campaign, put into this film. In fact, this film ended his career with, uh, with Dr. Pepper. I remember. But my dad kept talking about how we were going to watch a werewolf movie that night with the Dr. Pepper guy. And I, you know, was five or six and it fucking traumatized me. <laughs> but it traumatized me in a good way. It traumatized me to the point where as a creator to be, it made me so afraid. And in being that afraid, I realized there was a magic in the ability to provoke fear or outright terror in an audience, which made me want to learn to do that for myself. Yes. And the, another thing about American Werewolf that people don't, that especially people that have never seen the movie, they hear American Werewolf in London, they're like, oh, werewolf movie. Yes, this is a werewolf movie. Of course it is. But this is really a love story. And it's not just a love story between a man and a woman. It is, you know, Nurse Alex and David, that's such a great little love story. But the love story between David and Jack, and yes, I yes, mean, Jack is begging David to take his own life. You know, his best friend, his, the apparition. It's not even really a ghost. It's just like, and he's begging him. You know, you're gonna do this to somebody else, David. You have to take your own life. And something that I like is every time you see Jack, he's more decomposed than he was the last time. That's the care that they put into this is every time you see him, he's decomposing at the rate of that David is essentially, you know, because David's really going down that decomposition of, of uh, mentally where Jack is physically de decomposing. And it's so brilliantly written and so brilliantly executed. And I just... I think it's one of the best love stories of all time. And before I get to my next question, I want to slip a question in here for you. Your opinion on the end of the film. I know this, the end of this film gets very, very mixed reviews. What are your opinions on the end of the film? I, I, I love the hard house. I think the hard out is amazing. And this is not a film that requires an epilogue. This isn't a film, and horror in general typically cannot sustain the epilogue. We are asked to suspend disbelief to such a degree that we must buy into the idea, in the best horror, we are asked to buy into a normal, everyday, relatable situation. Uh, you know, we look at American Werewolf in London, um, you know, where it's about, you know, horny backpacking teenagers. We look at A Nightmare on Elm Street, which is a film all about the secrets behind white picket fences, The Exorcist, these films where you have a very, very, very stable reality and then you introduce an unstable element. Yeah. And that unstable element, if we can simply 
buy into that one piece, then we can buy into the engine of the story. However, once you remove that piece and we are left to look at what is essentially the cleanup, the janitorial work that must follow um, some sort of supernatural, you know, encounter experience, people who are dead, the corpses, well, how do we explain what just happened here? Yeah. Um, that is when you either need to go to great lengths to explain how, you know, you could possibly continue to exist in a world um, where this does not destroy your life, destroy your career, um, destroy your family, or we do what many other horror films do and we just ignore it. Um, or you do the smart thing that American Werewolf does and it just goes, we're done, out. The werewolf is yep. dead. You are, you know, you can come up with whatever ending you want because there is no good way to possibly explain what happens when Scotland Yard um, goes down to the end of that alley and they find a dead naked man when you have hundreds of people in Piccadilly Circus who are sawing, seeing an animal running around and biting off an inspector's head. There's no way to rationalize any of that. So it's better not to try. And it's also brilliant how it's such a heartbreaking, sad ending. And then you cut to black to Blue Moon playing. Yes. The As, Marcel's you know, version of Blue Moon, which is Yeah, and it's just wonderful. the funniest. To me, it's, it's so genius. And a lot of this film, the soundtrack of this film and the score are amazing. Uh, it's something that really gets overlooked because the practical effects, when I talk to anybody, the first thing they bring up is the practical effects. This movie has the best werewolf transition scene I've ever seen. Yes. Bar none. The hand, everything. It, it's perfect. It is absolutely perfect. And we already talked about with Jack, how he decomposes as the movie goes. The practical effects of this movie are absolutely amazing. Um, but there's a lot of death in this movie and there's a lot of dark moments. So which scene as a young lad affected you the most? I mean, I can honestly say the entire film really affected me and the initial encounter with the werewolf on the moors, um, it's wonderfully shot because it, there is this, and I'm assuming you've seen an American werewolf in Paris that, you know, the, the terrible, terrible, terrible semi-sequel that was made in the mid nineties and late nineties, yeah. um, which, you know, the CGI is never going to be a replacement for practical effects. Um, right. And CGI also has this incredible ability to date very, very quickly. Um, yeah. As bad as that movie looked in the 90s, it looks even worse now. It's the same thing, you know, George Lucas has done by pissing all over his original Star Wars films by putting in all sorts of cartoons running around. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't work. It's not tactile. It doesn't light properly. Um, and so what so many horror films and science fiction, anything genre that has tried to utilize practical effects um, where they've been most successful is limiting their use. And you have that old adage, art from adversity. And so if you don't have the money to show a, you know, a full lycanthrope attacking these two kids on the moors, you don't show it. You show right. the werewolf in little pieces, but you build up the tension by the POV shots and, you know, these kids looking around, but they can't see through the fog or the rain or whatever. And then something circling jumps us. Out. It's so brilliant because not only does it disguise the effect, which is, you know, the, the first trick to a special effect, mm -hmm. but it also builds that tension. So, yes, that first scene had me. If there is a sequence, then subsequently that topped it and really messed me up it was um the london underground it's the yeah. businessman getting off the train and by the way when i asked you earlier which version of the blu-ray you prefer this version that we both have unfortunately says it was remastered in 4k um and they have applied so much dnr to the film that it's a in, in a lot of shots it's this smudgy ugly mess and that yeah. London underground scene, poor dude, you know, he's like pockmarked in some shots and then other ones, he looks like he's fully animated. But that sequence where it's all werewolf POV and this guy is running and running and running and he finally gets to the escalator and he falls down, falls down and he yeah. looks over his shoulder and we get that incredible high shot looking down over his shoulders and coming into the top of the frame, a paw, another paw, the top of a head, and then we cut 
to the werewolf's POV getting closer and closer to this guy. That fucked me up in all the yeah. best ways. I love it. And again, the brilliance of this film, you go right from that to him naked in a zoo. Yes. I mean, like that, it's just, it's so brilliant the way that they ease the tension. And you're talking about building suspense and building tension. And for me, that really started, and I think that was perfected, in not only in American Werewolf in London, but Jaws. That's another one where you don't have to see the shark the whole movie sure. to know it's there and know how scary it is. And it less is more, especially in a horror movie like this and a horror movie like that, less is more. And I think that these movies perfected that. Um, so and it's also, I, 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 I'm sorry, I didn't mean no, to cut you off. No, go ahead. I, I just wanted to say that along those lines, I talked earlier about the tension ratcheting up. Um, those two sequences really had an effect on me, as I said, but I think if there was anything that I experienced with that movie for the first time that I would never fully experience again until The Exorcist, um, a short while later, it was going in, knowing what the premise was, at least just knowing as a kid what the base premise of the film was, sitting down and beginning to watch the story unspool. And the whole time, knowing where we would be going and saying to myself, I can handle this. I can handle this. It's getting a little scary. I can handle this. I can handle this. Oh, please don't let the bad things happen. And they start <laughs> happening and getting worse and getting worse. And that the fact that this movie spends most of its runtime building up to a character who is convinced he's going to become a werewolf. Mm -hmm. And he is freaking out because he may or may not be going crazy or he may or may not be um, visited by his best friend who is now one of the undead warning him that he's a lycanthrope. Either scenario, we have a ticking clock until the moon is full yeah. and we have that incredible montage set to CCR as David Naughton is just running around the apartment. He can't sit still. He can't read. He can't watch TV. He's just, and we've all felt that. And yeah. you begin to feel that as the viewer. And it's it's fantastic. It really is. And like I said, that's the best transformation scene of all time. If you guys haven't seen this movie, you're really missing out. This is such an amazing, amazing movie. Um, we've talked about which scene affected you. Now, I want to know what your favorite scene in the movie is. I, I've got to say, I mean, this is a movie filled with brilliant moments. And it's, it's like you, you mentioned one and you leave out ten. Yeah. I think that if there is, I, I think the dream sequences are probably my favorite parts of the film simply in the way that Landis manages to capture what a fever dream is like. When you've got, we've all been there where you have that 103 temperature or whatever. Oh, the Nazi werewolves, man. Oh my God, Nazi werewolves attacking a deer and tearing its head off and eating yes. it. The moment where where uh, David, you know, peers around the tree and he sees Nurse Alex next to a hospital bed in the middle of the woods that David is in and then he gets, you know, the, the werewolf teeth. It's so surreal. And he mentions that in the movies. Like, I've never had dreams this weird. Yeah. And John Landis tapped into what nightmares are like in a way that's surreal in nature, but is still grounded in recognizable pieces where you can connect the dots and find the point of origin. And yet they still go into these weird, weird places. It's amazing. I think the dream sequences are the strongest parts. See, and I, I know I've said the brilliance of the writing so many times here, but another thing that I think is so underrated is the first time we see Jack when he's undead. It's not this big light coming. It's not this big, you know, the music doesn't swell. He's just there. He's like, hey, man, can I have that toast? He asks for a piece <laughs> of toast. And, and he, he's dipping it in the eggs while he's talking about this. And he's got the little waddle piece. Yes. He's got the torn out piece that you can't take your eyes off of. It's brilliant, man. And you, you I mean, like, you can see that, you know, Landis, for those of you that don't know, he also did Animal House before he did American Werewolf. And you can see the comedy elements here because there are a lot of comedy elements to this movie as well. I think that this is absolutely a horror comedy, but it's a love story. This is one of those perfect films that it's like the back to the future of the horror genre. It has everything, man. It has love. It has horror. It has sci-fi. It's everything. And Landis did a great job with this movie. And a lot of people shit on it when it first came out because it had a little bit more comedy in it than people, what people had liked. But I think that this movie is the perfect blend of love, horror, and comedy. Um, so I think it's the only one that's really found the sweet spot 
yeah. with horror and comedy. A lot of horror comedies try and it's too far one way or it's too far the other. And I, I realized that American Werewolf was in so many ways, um, it was ahead of its time. And if you look at the critical reviews, as you said, it took a drubbing from a lot of people said it's too funny to be scary or it's too scary to be funny. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, as films have tried to copy that, whether successfully or unsuccessfully, it's only made the viewers mature to a point where we can return to 1981, see that movie and truly appreciate what it was that Landis was doing. Because when I was a kid and I saw that for the first time at five or six and um, was so scared that I had to keep watching it over and over again, it was never funny to me. There was no. nothing funny about that film. And then I became a geeky teenager reading Fangoria and, mm -hmm. and all of these things and learning about how these effects were done. And it stopped being scary because it was so funny. Now as a 44 year old adult, I, I, I shiver and laugh in equal measure. You, you could appreciate everything about this film. Yes. Um, so we know this is in your top three. I'm going to throw you a little bit of a curveball here. We talked about your first horror movie. Now I'm going to go scream on you. What's your favorite scary movie, Eric? <laughs> what is your favorite horror movie of all time? I've already touched on it. If, if I were backed into a corner with a gun to my head, it would be The Exorcist. Uh, that, okay. is, that is as close to a perfect horror film. Serious, legitimate, psychological, and visceral horror um, as I think we are ever going to see touched upon it a lot um and for those of you that have heard the story on the podcast a couple times i'm sorry but i always got to tell the story uh, the exorcist to me is always going to have a stigma around it because i watched horror movies at a young age I, i've always watched horror movies the exorcist was the only movie that my mother ever shut off she said nope you're not watching this so after that it always had that stigma around it you know we'd watch nightmare on elm street which i think that's where me and you were a little bit different i think that the original nightmare on elm street house is my favorite because that started everything for me but i think a nightmare on elm street is the perfect horror movie if you take out the last two minutes of that movie i think it's the perfect movie i think it's the best movie ever made and not to but, derail you not to derail you but we already established i have three and they are american werewolf the exorcist and the original nightmare on elm street so there we go we're simpatico dude there we go and it, it's amazing to me that you know, we can go back and watch these now as adults, um, especially The Exorcist. That's what I was getting at with that. We can go back to these as adults and feel completely different about The Exorcist as we did when we were kids, especially now that we're parents. You know, um, I have two little girls and going back and watching The Exorcist now from a parent's point of view oh, yes. is completely different than watching it as a child. I get scared for different reasons. I get nervous for different reasons as a parent. Um so it's amazing how stories can tell themselves so well that you feel differently about them as you grow. The, the more you the more you age, you get scared for different reasons. And that to me is something completely brilliant. Now, we always end these, my friends, with the same thing, a skull count. We are ranking American Werewolf in London on a skull count, zero being the worst, five being the best for the overall quality, production, everything about the film what would your skull ranking be zero to five this is an 11 man this is <laughs> this is a spinal tap 11 right there this film is hilarious it's terrifying and as you said it i mean it created the category for for special effects makeup yeah. uh, you know with the academy it's it star wars didn't even do that mm -hmm. an american werewolf in london i mean it all builds from star wars but this is the movie where the academy finally said all right look we got to there are amazing things happening right now. And so it needs to be recognized and underlined. And this is the film that did it. And it was a genre film that did yes. it. So uh, the Academy has always been famously uptight about genre films. The top two best, and this is just opinion, but the top two best when it comes to practical effect horror movies of all time, in my opinion, would be An American Werewolf in London and John Carpenter's The Thing. To me, oh, those two yeah. are the two best when it comes to practical effects. If you are a filmmaker looking to make your best practical effect movie you can possibly make, and I'm one of those people, I'm not going to shit on CGI. Now, there are really, really bad cases of CGI, like you said. Uh, the Thing prequel that just came out, uh, Freddy vs. Jason's another big one where you talk about the CGI <laughs> didn't age well. Oh, yes, yes. Um, but if you, if you can use CGI and practical together and make them look good, 
I think that they can really complement each other if you use them right. But I'm a guy that I grew up in the late 80s, early 90s. I'm going to gravitate towards practical 10 out of 10 times. Um, I want to remind me, make sure your links down in the description, not just to follow him and stay updated on the things he's doing, but as well to check out, even if you can't donate to the Howard County Autism Society, at least check out the good work that they're doing. And it, like he said, if you can get out, I know it's hard right now with COVID, but if you can volunteer in any way, even if it's through a screen to help somebody, that's what we need to be doing right now is love and help and support because there's a lot of darkness and a lot of hate in this world. So if we can brighten up somebody's day, especially a child, there's nothing better than brightening up their day. And you don't know how much you can influence the positivity of a child, especially a child with autism. You can change their whole life just with kindness. So remember that because <sighs> bullying can be a hard thing. And especially to a child with autism that doesn't understand it. Uh, luckily, we live in a world now to where that's really out there. So autistic children don't get the bullying that a lot of other kids do because people love them more. And that's a great thing, but they still need that support and they need peer to peer support. So anything you can do to help out is so appreciated. Eric, my friend, don't go anywhere. I got a couple more questions for you. Everybody else. Thank you so much. Keep talking horror, stay what you are, and we'll see you guys soon.